Hey, this is Trevor from Halifax calling in to say that I support creative control on Patreon because I think long form arts journalism is a crucial part of music culture and there's simply not enough of it out there today. Vish is a master interviewer. He lands great guests and he has his finger on the pulse of the ever changing music landscape, both here in Canada and abroad. For all of these reasons and many more, I think you should support Creative Control on Patreon too. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. I'm Visha's wife and I will love him no matter what you do. And now he has me on the record saying that. This episode of Long Night with Vish Khanna is brought to you by Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts and features conversations with Toronto musician Laura Barrett, podcaster and host of The Gravy Train, Jordan Heath Rawlings, Saskatchewan-based Cree visual artist Joy T. Arcand, and from the rock and roll band Sloan, Jay Ferguson. Long Night was staged before a live audience at the Harbourfront Centre in Toronto and recorded with minor technical issues on Friday, December 13th, 2019. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Long Night. We're here at the Harbor Front Center. What do you think of that? This is nice, isn't it? These nice digs that we got? It's very nice. Uh, thank you for being here. How about a round of applause for both my sidekick, James Keast, and the bicycles? So this is a, a little moment that I'm going to have with you. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to say exactly, uh, but it's sort of a bittersweet night because uh, we've been doing a long night for how long now? Uh, do you know? Seven and a half years. Seven and a half years, and uh, it's been quite a run, and it's going to, I think, continue to be quite a run. However, uh, I am moving to Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, that's... You're the applause lady. You're not supposed to boo. I hate it. Well, I'm sorry. Just Can we talk about this later? Okay, I guess we'll talk about it now. No, I, I am, uh, my physical being is moving to Edmonton. Uh, however, I'm hoping maybe to keep the show going in some capacity uh, remotely. Would you like to see that? A Google Hangout version of Long Night maybe? I don't know. Not to plug any particular company. Uh, but I just wanted to say uh, this has been a very significant and meaningful experience for me to host this show. Uh, it's The show is... <laughs> For some reason, it's done pretty well. Uh, I can't explain it myself, but it's gone to St. John's, Newfoundland, and uh, all over the... No, that's pretty much it. It went to St. John's, Newfoundland, <laughs> and it, it was on... It was... Oh, we had it. We actually... That's right. We had a show. Uh, Bell Media hired us to do a version of the show, and uh, well, and they don't do that anymore. They don't... They don't help us anymore for some reason, but it was good. That was a fun experience. Yeah, we've had lots of uh, amazing experiences. Uh, I, in my work, I think of myself as um, some kind of convener. I like to bring communities together. I like to connect people. I think that's why I do what I do. It's certainly not for the money. Um, and so it's been hugely significant for me to get to do this show and have politicians and athletes and all sorts of amazing people from Toronto and uh, you know around the world, really, on this show. Our first ever guest, when I thought about this today, our first guest on our very first episode was Lou Barlow of uh, Sebado and Dinosaur Jr., who happened to be in town. And on the second episode, our guest was Ben Johnson, which was a huge get in the 80s. Um, <laughs> not so much when he... My favorite part of the Ben Johnson thing is he came to do the talk show, and when we went to commercial, he said, so where are the cameras? No. Well, no? So, do I have to tell Well, I was going to so keep this short. Johnson had been told it was a talk show concept, right. et cetera, and we acted as if it was a TV show, including commercial breaks. Uh, and I think this confused him because I think his people had explained, like, oh, yeah. it's just like a talk show or whatever. Yeah. And then he arrived in the basement of the pre-renovated Longboat Hall. That's right. Which was a, basically a construction site. And uh, we're doing this talk show to an audience. And in the and then Vish throws the commercial. And in the commercial, Ben Johnson leans over to you and says, is this going anywhere? That's now? right. That's true. You're absolutely your right. With great enthusiasm, was I think it's going really well. <laughs> that is true, and a better version of that story. But I do. That's true. You're right. All this to say, it's a magical. It's been a magical thing for us. I hope we can keep it going. Bicycles, would you like to keep doing this somehow, if we can? You don't go to Edmonton. You stay here. I can't afford to do this unless we can get Bill Media back on board. But anyway. 
Uh, it's been very fun, and I hope we can keep doing it. And that's all I want to say. So thank you for being here on what might be the final long night uh, of me here in person. Uh, and if you know anyone uh, with a gift certificate to Air Canada that can get me here for every other show, uh, please let me know. But thank you. Thank you for being here. It's a, it's a monumental night. Okay, let's get on with the show. Our first guest is an amazing musician from Toronto, and their latest album is Who is the Baker? We're thrilled that she could join us on Long Night. Please say hello to Laura Barrett. <laughs> Laura, nice to see you. It's nice to be here. This is an honor, and... Yeah, I won't get sentimental quite yet. I'm planning not to get sentimental until a bit later. Yeah, bit no, later. that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. It's nice to have you. There's nothing to be sentimental about. I'm alive. I didn't die or nothing. No, I'm, no. We're not warning anything. No, no. Just, it's, it's just, just your presence in yes. Toronto. Yes. Well, it's a, it's a celebratory thing for me to have you here because I, I just read this today and I hadn't even realized it. Has it been 11 years since you released a record? Yeah. 11 years. <laughs> yeah. What was, what, what, why the delay? What was going on? Great question. Um, so 11 years, a lot can happen in 11 years. And what happened for me was a major breakup of a 10 year relationship and going back to school to get my master's of teaching because I wasn't necessarily paying rent with m music money. And a lot of things. Life, life happened. Life happened. And yeah. I wrote songs consistently, but didn't put most of them on this album. And then this was me saying, oh my goodness, I have all of these songs waiting to come out and be listened to by other ears. And I'm really proud of it. It just took a, a, an awful long time. Right. <laughs> sure. Right. But I was doing other things. Oh, yeah. I scored two films. With yeah, you were doing music, <laughs> yeah, that's right, <laughs> with uh, Jose Contreras, yes, right? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So you've been working in music, but I mean, I think you're, you're maybe getting to what a lot of musicians are going through right now um, in terms of, is the work really viable? Is it, w not that, it, it, I hate to say, is it worth it? Because of course it is. But were you struggling with that a little bit? You were saying you weren't paying the rent with... I wasn't paying the rent, rent with it, but it was still worth it, yeah. And it was still viable in terms of my heart, but financially... Living in Toronto, being an artist, those yeah. two things, and we're we all know it. But then now there are stats that really show how desperate a situation it, it is. Yeah, and it's how the planning isn't here for any kind of affordable housing or yeah. I'm just holding on to my apartment that I've lived in for seven years and hoping that um, the ceiling doesn't cave in, which it has threatened to many times. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, fun times. Fun times. <laughs> Happy fun times. Friday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for being here. It's nice to see you. Uh, now, the record is called Who is the Baker? Yeah. Which begs the question, Laura, who <laughs> is Whoops. the baker? Whomsoever Who might. is this baker? What does the title mean exactly? Well, the title... It, there's a title track called Who is the Baker? And the lyrics in that are about confrontations between two, two elements, two people. So who is the baker, who the roast, who feels it the most when it happens? I'll just say the lyrics. Are you just going to say the lyrics for the rest of the interview just to explain yourself? <laughs> yeah. That's a fascinating tack to take. Um, no, I'm not going to bore you with that. But it's about maybe events, maybe confrontations between two different um, positions of, of place. It was written before the breakup, and it was kind of about the breakup, but in, in the time since that, that time, yeah. it's become about other things um, after the fact. And when I play it, it, it's fun. You can take songs that you wrote about one right. subject, and they, they morph. So who is the baker? There are other roles. It's not just, the, it's not just about baking. There's... Um, there's but a Thai is food. A, is, is this a, a, some sort of comment on domesticity, so to speak, or am I reading into it too much? You can read into it whatever you'd like. I because it's either that or like someone angry at a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Meaning, who is the baker who made this? There's <laughs> hairs in here. Show me the show baker. me the baker. Yeah, show me the baker is my follow up, and you just <laughs> scooped me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, no, but I because I, I my understanding from listening to it, in fact is that this is very much uh, about 
time. Are this is an autobiographical record on some level. Pretty much, yeah. And yeah. you're some of the and w there's a song where you're kind of wandering around Toronto. Yeah, yeah. And what's the name of that song? Where I'm from. Where I'm from. <laughs> and that song that's good, good title. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but it made me think like it's so interesting when you because I'm going through this right now I'm leaving a city that I've been in 23 years yeah. and as you and one of the reasons I think I'm leaving is because I feel like there's too much of me in it everywhere I go I can kind of remember uh, you know relationships and feelings I had about people and on some level I want to get rid of it um, and I feel like that is that a little bit of that going on in there, that song there's a huge amount of that and for me having grown up here and also uh, my mother and I lived in many many neighborhoods because um, she rented and so um, I've lived in so many different parts of the city that I now see as an adult and it's like oh that's the place that used to be a dry cleaners and I lived above that yeah. or that's the place that used to be a pizza bar and all of these places used to be something but they've been demolished or turned into something else right. and um, that's the kind of city that I'm faced with all the time which isn't entirely negative because there are good changes uh, happening in the city. I just think that it, to be confronted by all of that nostalgia and also maybe not to be able to escape your child, childhood self in a way because I did move away for a year. I lived in Vancouver for a year yeah. and I did not like it <laughs> and there were many reasons for that but at least I tried living as an adult in a different city and I think yeah. that was a big move. So I think it's a, I mean, yeah. It's yeah, fascinating to, to me to hear you talk about all of this because there's a lot of cycles of life, of your own life, going on throughout this record. And one of the things that struck me is I remember interviewing you many years ago um, for a piece in Exclaim magazine, and it's called it, the, the segment or whatever is called uh, What I Play. Mm -hmm. And I, at the time, you were kind of well known for playing the kalimba, which mm -hmm. not many people were playing at the time. But as we got into your history, you revealed that you, I believe you were trained as a classical pianist? Yeah, I did Suzuki Method and then Royal Conservatory. Suzuki Method being more ear focused, so yeah. that's what I started with, which right. I really appreciate, um, because then there's no barrier. There's no code that you have to figure out just to right. play something. And then, yeah, I did conservatory training all the way up to grade nine, which is just shy of the final grade, <laughs> grade 10. I don't know why I stopped, because um, it'll be much harder to go back in and, and finish it. So I'm a fraud. I'm an imposter. I only... No, no, no. Just, just take it easy. Don't beat yourself up in front of all these people. You're fine. You're doing fine. Just, I don't need a breakdown on my final show. Yeah. Right? Just yeah. I'm really down. emotional. I don't know how you do no, it. No, no. It's, it's, it's just I have no feeling. I just have no feelings at all, and I just keep going. The reason I bring this up, though, is because you're, uh, I think, reflecting upon your your life here and that's fascinating you took you you stopped at grade nine and then became known for playing the kalimba mm -hmm. and now this record is, is it fair to say this is a very piano centric it's, record it's seven eighths piano and it uh, even the one track that has kalimba has piano duetting yes that's right yeah and and i really liked that that was kind of like cloning myself and playing yeah. in a room with this other version of myself and the piano is my first love musically, and I can do a lot more in terms of a symphonic feel. I can, yeah. Yeah, I have more octaves, and I have more um, of a dynamic range. So to go, to return to the piano, but also take what I learned from playing kalimba, because the kalimba is set up in such a way that the middle note physically is the lowest note pitch-wise, oh. and your left and right hands are are splitting up the octaves. So Melodies are played evenly with left and right hands, which physically means your left and right brain is activated constantly. Mm. And it's just, it's a different way. It's like taking the piano into the fifth dimension and rotating it and bring it back right. down. Okay. So the kalimba is imprinted on me and every instrument I've played, I, I learned bass to play in a band with Dana Snell. <laughs> oh, with Dana from the Bicycles. That's yeah, cool. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah, applause for Dana Snell and the Bicycles. Yeah. And so playing bass is also, I bring that in to my piano playing because right. now I know what it's like to, to root in with the, the rhythm section and, and play that. So, yeah. 
Okay. I don't know if that no. answers. No, it does. <laughs> and I, I know, okay, I, I, I'll level with you. We don't have a lot of time I in this segment, and I feel like we could talk a lot more, and maybe we will. Maybe we will later or something, but it's a fascinating record, I must ask, 11-year gap. That was striking to me today. Um, have you, and I assume this record was years in the making as well. Yeah, yeah. Some of the 11 years was spent working on this, clearly. Yes, yeah, some of the 11 years, yeah. <laughs> um, so what's next? Do you have an idea of, uh, are we going to ha- see another gap, or are you thinking already about, did this open up? Planning cr- for a gap. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, I have something coming up in 2020, which is really exciting. It's going to be another um, film score, and it's a documentary about Honest Ed's which is very near and dear to my heart. So um, I'm really excited about that. The director is Lulu Wei, and she was personally affected by the West Bank development of that site, and she's been documenting it for years. So that, um, I'm on board as the composer for that. And then I have been writing a lot more than eight songs in 11 years would indicate, and I have lots more music in me to to give. That's good to hear. I was... <laughs> I, it just time has flown by, and I missed you making music. We used to talk every time you made a record. We would talk. Yeah, and so I'm and then we didn't talk for eleven. I years. I know we didn't talk for eleven <laughs> years, and I feel badly. I'm sorry. Does that make me a bad person? I don't I mind a bit. <laughs> I was trying to wrap up, but go ahead. <laughs> okay, go ahead. The score for the Honest Ed's documentary is it just going to suddenly stop once in a while and then back up and take a completely different direction? In the spirit of honesty. Oh, are you going to get lost? I don't know where I am now. You know, I have to take my cues from the director and, and the, the film, so, um, so I maybe. can't say. So maybe. It I've only happen. seen a short rough cut of a, a portion of the film, so um, early early days yet. Maybe I shouldn't even talk about it. On live yeah, we're sort Radio of TV. live, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that you are trying to capture the history of the city as it develops and changes. I think that's important. Uh, we lose, as we become more ephemeral with our stuff, mm-hmm. it's nice to know that you're trying to capture your memories and, and, and maybe capture some stuff with that documentary. It sounds really fascinating. I'm really, really jazzed for it. And hopefully also, for those of you without compact disc players, there hopefully will be a vinyl version of this in the future, um, but for now, it's it's available in the in the cloud. Where can people learn more about you and and this record? LauraBarrett.net um, by googling Laura Barrett Music. Okay. <laughs> Facebook. Okay. It's on a the label, places. isn't it? It's on Paper Bag Records. Yeah, so okay. go to paperbagrecords.com. Okay, so people as well. can maybe yeah. buy it there. All right, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the show. How about a round of applause for honor. Laura Barrett, everyone? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for we have to me. take a quick break. Uh, we'll th- take a quick break, and then we'll be back with more. Stick around. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again for being here on Long Night. How about another round of applause for Laura Barrett, everybody? <laughs> Our next guest is the uh, a member of the Frequency Podcast Network family. Uh, he makes a show called The Big Story, and he's also responsible, or co-responsible, I suppose, uh, for a huge new uh, hit in the podcasting world. It's called The Gravy Train. Please make some noise for Jordan Heath Rawlings, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Jordan. I'm well. Thank you so much for being on the show. First of all, just to contextualize you a little bit, uh, what I sort of did there, but what is your background? What do you do exactly, Jordan? Uh, I am thankfully still employed and no longer a print journalist, uh, which is what I did for several years. So, well, Who did you write for? Uh, every paper in the city that's not the National Post uh, okay. at one point or another. And, uh, that was both specific and vague at the same time. How yeah, did you pull that well, off? Every major media corporation in the city except for Post Media. No, I worked for The Star. Uh, I did a short stint at The Globe and Mail. I worked at that bright orange paper, 24 Hours, if you know Toronto. Um, uh-huh. And then I was one of the founding editors of Sportsnet Magazine at Rogers and worked with their magazines for a while. And then when the magazines uh, went elsewhere, I went and started a podcast network. Nice. And here we are. We started the first uh, daily news podcast in Canada uh, about a year and a half ago. And then we released The Gravy Train uh, eight weeks ago. It just wrapped up. 
yesterday. So yes. you can binge the whole thing for free wherever you want. Now, so I didn't realize this. Did you actually, you started the Frequency Podcast Network? This is your I baby? I did. Okay. I was the uh, first employee, me and Claire Broussard, who was the lead producer of The Big Story. It was yes. just us for okay. a long time. Right. It was very lonely, <laughs> but we did it every day. <laughs> and when did you start this? What year was it? Last year, oh. June uh, 2018. Okay, and yeah. and the the big story is is also a hit, is it not? It does well. It's a hit podcast. If you if you like hit podcasts, and basically yeah. it's a it's a summation of Canadian news for the day, or is it a single story? Uh, it is a single story. Every day we talk to uh, because I worked for basically every paper. Uh, I know all of the journalists who do all the actual reporting, and then I just bother them to come and answer questions so I can profit from their expertise. It's a very good business model. I recommend it. That's what journalism is now, isn't it? That's what podcasting is. I've been, I've been doing it Journalists wrong. actually still do work. I'm not a journalist anymore. I'm a podcaster. You don't feel like a journalist anymore? You sound like a journalist on the gravy train. I'll say that much. Uh, well, I was a journalist during the Rob Ford years. Right. So, there you go. Um, I, I mean, I was a city editor during that time. That time, uh, if, if all of you here uh, lived in Toronto during that time, a very strange and troubling and fascinating time in our city's history and a story that... I thought we needed to look back on, especially because as you look back on it, that happened in 2010, and Rob Ford passed away a few years ago, and then there was Trump, and then there was Boris Johnson, and then there was Doug Ford, and Rob Ford uh, was the harbinger of all of that. And if you look at the playbook that all of these guys use, it's the playbook he used, and it happened here. Nothing ever happens first in Toronto. This happened first that's, here. That's sort of true. I think. I, I, what else did we set? It. When's the last time we set a trend? Well, broken a global social trend. Scene, broken social scene made it so that you couldn't just have like three people in your band. Oh yeah, you needed like twelve. Okay, you need like That's twenty fair. people in your band, and it's uh, ridiculous. so we got like multi-piece orchestral uh, bands yeah. and uh, populism. I tweeted about I tweeted about this. I think as soon as I listened to the first episode of the Gravy Train, I said something like, "I kind of thought that the Trump people were." maybe vaguely copying what Rob Ford had done. But as your show unfolded, I'm like, oh, no, they fully seem to have taken everything he said and did and are doing it themselves. That's what you're getting at when you talk about the influence uh, of that period, right? Look, I, I want to be uh, explicit here because I do it on the podcast, too. Rob Ford and Donald Trump are not the same people. Rob Ford was an actual person. He was not a malignant narcissist. Yeah. He had a heart. Um, I, I disagree with almost everything he ever did, but he was an actual person with a family he cared about and he helped kids and et cetera, et cetera. Take that for whatever it is. Right. The playbook is the exact the politics, same. The political it is playbook. the exact same. Is, um, the best way, the best example I have is fake news. Um, if you remember when the crack video, with the first report of the crack video came out, Two days later, they put a poll in the field, uh, Nanos, and it said that 50% of the people in Toronto did not believe the crack video was real. They right. believed that the Toronto Star was making the whole thing up. Right. And Rob Ford called out the Toronto Star by name. He called out their reporters by name, and he forced them to defend themselves. And if you're a reporter and you're defending yourself from a personal attack, you can't be objective anymore. And then guess who's already won? And the fight's over. Right. Um, and that's, listen, that's what happens everywhere now. So... Before Rob, like I, you get into this on the show, is this unprecedented in political, you know, machinations or populism's is, not unprecedented? But, but this was this a whole new attacking the media by name, by name, uh, who are going to be the people who are holding you to account yep. is a pretty genius move. I mean, and that's yeah. what's going on. And now we we live in a society where no one trusts any information, yep. no matter how legitimate it might be. So. Good job, Rob Ford. I mean, uh, he succeeded at what he set out to do, even if he didn't know he was doing it. That's just um, it. Did he know if he was doing it? Did he, did he, sorry, did he know what he was doing exactly? You know, um, Robin Doolittle, who anybody who followed the Ford story, yeah, <laughs> there's a Doolittle fan in the house. Is that Doolittle? Are you out there? No. Um, Anybody who followed the story knows uh, the work that Doolittle did. We went to journalism school together. Uh, she's a good friend of mine. She appears a lot on the podcast. Um, and she says that he might not have known the implications of what he was doing, but he had this savage political instinct uh, for survival right. that manifests itself in, in going right back at anybody who says anything critical of him that he doesn't like. Right. And I don't, think he, I don't think he had this Machiavellian plan to sow distrust in the global media and et cetera, et cetera. Right. But he certainly wanted people to disagree with the media and agree with him or at the very least doubt the fact that they were saying he was smoking crack. 
You've and they did. Right, and they did. And it's it's a remarkable story, and the cast of characters, it was, it was very Canadian on some level, so even the kind of, you know, the weirdos in council that we, you know, like the weird characters, like there's now a whole cohort of them that are similar in America and, and in England as well that are supporting their leaders. But I do agree this was something we hadn't seen before, but what was your goal in telling this story exactly? Because I was walking home uh, from a show in Guelph last night with my friend Nathan Lohr, and we were walking and he said, man, I just finished the gravy train and I was in tears because they That's humanized nice. Rob Ford, and I'm angry. I'm angry that I have sympathy for Rob Ford. That's fair. And what was? And you made the distinction like I want to make sure it's clear. Trump is a whole other breed of cat compared to Rob Ford, and that comes across in your show. Were you conflicted doing this? You have humanized yes. a person that we've long thought of as a villain. I mean, there are problems that exist in Toronto today, every day, that you can trace back to Rob Ford. The reason the transit is fucking horrible is because he canceled Transit City as soon as he came to office. That's mm -hmm. not good, right. just demonstrably. Um, but Rob Ford was a real person in a way that Donald Trump is not. And I think you can't tell the story of Rob Ford without, uh, without making that clear. You know, our goal with the podcast was to introduce you to how Rob Ford came to power, which should make you furious, and then to show you how he couldn't handle anything to do with governing or that power or his own personal life, which should make you laugh because it was a joke, and then to show you that he was somebody caught up in the depths of addiction, and it was a tragedy. And one of the things we wanted to do in the last couple of episodes is not so much humanize Rob Ford, though I'm glad uh, if people think that happened, but I want us to look back. It was, you know, it wasn't that long ago, but we talk about mental illness and addiction in a very different way now than we did even five years ago. And you look back at some of the ways that we covered him at that time, um, and we were laughing at a guy that was literally spiraling into the kind of addiction that would endanger him and others, and it was a national joke. And, and the acceleration with which we've developed empathy for such things is, fa I mean, you mentioned Robin Doolittle, and I remember getting a copy of the book, and it was called Crazy Town. Yeah. And even then, I was like, that's not a good, that's not a good title, this guy clearly. Like, I, I mean, the town did go crazy, we did. The town we, all, went, we all went, the crazy. Town went crazy. It was crazy. But it had this big, f his face on the cover, and I thought, no, he's got mental health issues, I think, and addiction issues from what I heard and what I knew. Yeah. And it felt like, so you were kind of shining a light on. I mean, if Rob Ford was just, can I just, if Rob Ford was just an asshole like Donald Trump, it wouldn't be an interesting story to tell. It would right. just be a story where the bad guy wins. Right. Um, and that's not fun right. for anybody. This is a story where the guy who shouldn't have won, won. And it broke both the city that he won governorship over and himself because he clearly couldn't handle it. If we wanted to tell a story about the asshole who wins, we would have told Doug Ford's story. Right, 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 right. So, and yes, it has this, I, like I, my friend Nathan said, like it's, he, he seemed to be forced into a position where he had to recognize he had a problem and then shortly thereafter was diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. So it's a very sad story. You have to admit, it's a very sad uh, story. It's, he's a sad yeah. guy. Like, um, all the stories, all the journalists you talk to for this um, have stories that humanize Rob Ford, not because they really liked him or because they thought he was good, but because you could see him struggling and you could see him being a, a guy who was lost and who was wrestling with something, yeah. something greater than himself. And ultimately, like, there's no point in telling a story like this. And I want to tell the story because it's the most interesting story that ever happened to Toronto, really. And yeah. that's, Except you know. for the broken social scene thing. Right, except for that. But yeah. I couldn't get them, so yeah, I got Rob Ford. <laughs> no, what does this story, what does this podcast tell us about Toronto from your perspective? We've kind of touched upon this a little bit, but what, what do we learn about Toronto? So this started when? When did this start? 2013? Uh, I mean, it started in 2000 when That's he became true. a when city became, councilor. Yeah. And but 2010, he became mayor. Right. So what, and like I say, things have accelerated quickly. We have maybe more understanding and more information about him and what, and particularly because of your podcast. But what do we know about Toronto and Rob Ford's vision of Toronto and his supporters' vision of Toronto? The one thing that you say, and I think the second or sec, second last or final episode is everyone, if it wasn't for the cancer he would have won 
yeah. he would have won again. Most, most people we talk to think, you know, he had a real shot at winning again, even despite that he'd admitted to everything. Yes. So um, what does this tell us about Toronto look, and, and uh, these days with Doug Ford as the premier? What does it tell us about Ontario? I'm I mean, leaving the province, by the way. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you're, where are you going? Alberta. It's yeah, great. it's great. Utopian, yeah. Progressive utopia. No, you're going to, yeah, nothing like Doug Ford. I'm going to need a Don't passport worry. in five months. Yeah, you are actually. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be great. Another passport. You're gonna you're gonna find a way to the ocean. Don't worry, they'll okay. make it happen. Thank um, you. No, sorry. But no, I, just to finish up quickly. Um, the one thing that I really came away from this podcast with is I wanted to tell this story because this is the story of Toronto and it's still happening now. Uh, we love to think Canadians in general, Torontonians maybe in particular. We like to think that we're better than the madness that is going on in a lot of the rest of the world. We look at Trump and Brexit and everything and say, oh, thank God, you know, that didn't happen. It happened here first. Yeah. We did it. We opened it up. Yeah. Uh, we wrote the book and everybody else is copying our playbook. And, uh, you know, stop. Get off your high horse. That's it. It's been a cheery episode thus far. Listen. It's a great city. Um, and only is, it, is only, it a great city? I yes. can't decide anymore. I love this city. and I, think, I don't know if you heard what Laura was saying, but that didn't sound good. And now you tell this story about this guy and how he almost won an election despite uh, you know everything we knew about him. He probably would have won again. Why is it a great city? I know we have to wrap up. Do you have a final question, by the way? I want to leave room. Okay, you haven't good. said a damn word. Well, no, it's good. I, <laughs> I, I, I prefer it. I prefer it. No, no. I, I, do you have anything? I can give you a time if you know. Okay. Do you want to defend Toronto? I know you like Toronto. The NBA yes. There you go. Okay. That's more eloquent than I could ever be. Fuck yeah. You don't say anything the whole time, then you get an applause break? How does that work? All right. Well, he said the only positive thing that came out of this that's, discussion. That's true. Okay. Well, all right. So uh, we're out of time, unfortunately, Jordan. I wish we could spend more time uh, talking. But yes, the gravy train uh, just wrapped up literally as we're speaking yesterday. Fantastic. I think, I hope this, I don't know if they're really legitimate podcasting awards anywhere in this country. Yeah, they're slow, but they're coming. I, I hope this is recognized as the truly great thing it is. And I congratulate you on it. Well, before I let you go, I, as I always do, what's next for you? I mean, this is seems like it was a lot of work. It was. Everybody was asking us if we're going to do Doug for season two, and I said no because Doug is just a worse version of Rob. Um, there's no story to tell there. It's so, not done yet either. Yeah, it's also makes it, harder, it's, harder it makes it harder. Um, yeah. We are planning a season two uh, of some a political story in Canada that has ramifications around the world. Um, I can't tell you exactly what it is yet, uh, but also just if you're, we've got a whole bunch of good things planned. So uh, if you like podcasts, go to frequencypodcastnetwork.com or just look us up in your favorite podcast player and hit that five stars. <laughs> Listen, it's programmed into me now. That's how I end yeah, conversations with my wife. That, that, poli <laughs> that political thing sounds interesting. I'm looking forward to that. Whatever you're talking about there sounds good. That's so some good stuff. Stay tuned for the broken social scene story coming up next. Yes, if you can get them, set. if you can get them to talk to me, I'm in. I've been known to get them. It's fine. All right, we have to go. Uh, how about a hand for Jordan Heath Rawlings, everyone? We'll be back with more on Long Night. Stick around. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Pizza Trocadero, the finest pizzeria in all of Guelph. Isn't that right, sir? Oh, of course it is. I love it so much I can hardly stop eating it. Yeah, you love Pizza Trocadero a lot, don't you? Yeah, I do. Is it your favorite pizza place in Guelph? Oh, of course it is. There's no other place you like better? Uh, I like Pizza Trocadero the best. Are you sure? Yes, I am. I feel like you're not being honest with me. I am honest. Anyway, Pizza Trocadero is gr great. You can learn more about them at trocaderoguelph.ca and you can call them for pickup or delivery at 519-829-2444. That's Pizza Trocadero, the place of the good trade, right? Yep, and my favorite pizza there is Hawaiian style, probably. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Long Night, everyone. Uh, how about another round of applause for uh, to Jordan Heath Rawlings for being on the show. Our next guest is a visual artist who originally hails from Saskatchewan. We're so pleased that she could be here tonight. So please say hello to Joy Arcan, everyone. Joy Arcan. Hi, Joy. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to have you here. So before I, I was I correct, you're from Saskatchewan originally? Always. Always? Are you there now? 
I'm always from there, but I live in Ottawa. You're living in Ottawa now. Yeah. What brings you to, what brought you to Ottawa, I should say? Love. Oh. <laughs> Ottawa. Wow. Ottawa is the city of love. That's what yeah. we like to say in Canada. That's what I heard. Right. And what are you, what are you <laughs> doing beyond loving in Ottawa, <laughs> if I might ask in a very weird way? <laughs> Oh uh, well, no! What um, are you? What? No, that's it, really. <laughs> um. Just, just, just <laughs> loving, loving life. Loving Ottawa, making art. Making art. Yeah. I, I didn't uh, uh, maybe characterize you as completely as I could have, but I knew you were coming out here, <laughs> and so we could talk about that. So uh, yes, in terms of your practice, what what is it you do exactly, Joy? Well, as you said, I'm a visual artist, and um, I do a lot of things. I studied photography in university, so that was my basis and my entry into the art world. And from there, I just uh, am probably most known for neon lights, neon signs, and installation art these days. So um, I'm primarily working with Cree syllabics and taking over public spaces with that type of work. Okay, well, let's begin with the neon. That's interesting. What yeah. was it about that as a as a medium, I suppose, that interested you. Neon lights, I mean, we associate them with signs and things like that, I guess. What else do we, mm -hmm. is that pretty much it, isn't it? What else do yeah, we need neon lights for? <laughs> I mean, obviously you're making art with it, so that's cool. We need it for art, yeah. Um, well, to like rewind a bit, I, I had originally done a project that was photo-based that uh, I did in 2009, which reimagined signage that was in English and then I had translated it into Cree hmm. and so coming from Saskatchewan I went around the province in Cree territories and I took the source image from say 20th Street in Saskatoon or uh, Sweetgrass First Nation and then I would digitally alter that signage into Cree and it's just asking the question of like what would the world look like if we prioritize indigenous languages the same way we do English and French. Right. So from there, that's where I began to actually construct these signs and make them a reality in a three in this 3D world we live in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So okay. okay. So I took that concept and I and I was like, okay, let's let's actually make these things and see what that looks like. I want to ask you more about your motivation for this project. Uh, what what were you th what were you feeling going into this project in terms of your intent versus when you were kind of done what you discovered about this idea of making Cree language more normalized so to speak or more commonplace? Um, well, I was just like, as an artist, I was able to imagine something and bring it to life. And a lot of people think like, oh, wow, that's really revolutionary. But it's actually not really, <laughs> not to discredit my own work, but it's something You're that is so right very, don't, don't do this. A lot of it is something going on very here. simple that I think um, it is being done more and more now, but back then, it's not even that long ago. It's like 2009. Um, ten, 10 years ago, that's roughly. 10 years yeah. ago. That's when you started <laughs> this, this? Yeah, project? yeah. So I was, I was just working in an office job at a, a cultural center in Saskatoon where my primary job was um, graphic design and working with language, indigenous language. So I was thinking about it every day. Yeah. It was my nine to five job. Right. So I just I just wanted to see it happen. So I, I did it with Photoshop. <laughs> you did it all with Photoshop? Photoshop. Okay, yeah. okay. And what were the reactions or the reception to your work uh, initially in 2009? Is this still your medium? Is this still your practice now? Yeah, still, yeah. You're still doing the same thing? Basically. I mean, right. So you mentioned that maybe societal thoughts about it have evolved uh, yeah. and that it's more commonplace now as, yeah. as an idea. But can you describe the difference exactly between the reception to this work uh, when you started doing it versus now? I'm just curious. Um, that is a very good question. Uh, it didn't get a lot of reception in 2009, although I did happen to exhibit that work here 
at uh, Harbor Front Center for the very first time. At that time? In, in 2010. 2010, okay. So it's very nice to be back here as artists in residence. So no reception or? Little. <laughs> Very little reception. So, does that <laughs> was it positive at the time? Sure. <laughs> you see, you seem as indifferent as the reception seems yeah. to have been. Yeah. No, time. I guess it was just because I was an emerging artist at the time. It was just you know a few people saw it. But at the same time, I think what you're possibly getting at in terms maybe, of descri <laughs> describing <laughs> the context is that maybe we were less attuned. Maybe. To it could be. even thinking about yes. the notion that this there was Absolutely. this erasure going on, yep. and now there's a high, heightened so. consciousness for it, right? Yeah, I think you're right. I think the time right now is is hopefully people are more ready for it. Right. And, yeah. So are you getting more? If you're getting feedback from people, is it more from people within the Cree community or or your communities, or are you getting uh -huh. more of an embrace and an appreciation for it from people outside of those communities? Um, all across the board, um, I think, you know, I, I, it's hard sometimes to get reaction when you are working with public works yes. versus a gallery situation. So when it is outdoors and people walk by it, there, it's hard to gauge a reaction. Um, but some of the times when I'm in galleries and, and they have like little feedback forms or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's been very positive. Uh, my favorite reaction is from an exhibition at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, um, which, you know, is like a lot of Cree speakers there and a uh, high indigenous population. So uh, it was a part of the exhibition Insurgence Resurgence. And they had some like young Cree kids come into the gallery, and they visited with. Uh, they had like uh, some cameras and stuff, so I was able to see the footage of these kids' reactions, and that is by far my favorite reaction to my work ever. Hmm. It was uh, these kids just seeing themselves in a gallery, yeah, and recognizing that that's for me is so powerful. Yeah, so that's. that's that's my primary audience. <laughs> Is your favorite reaction then also the reaction that has surprised you the most? Does that make sense? Um, like, are you surprised to see a younger generation care as much as they seem to have? I was not surprised. I just think that the it, there should be more. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, like... It shouldn't be a unique event. So sure. a, as a result of your work, you're, uh, it seems to me that you were a part of uh, an early group of people doing this kind of work. So you're seeing it happen more and more now. A little. I hope so. You, you hope so, or are you seeing it? I am seeing it, yeah, okay. for sure. Would you want to give anyone advice, even your, yourself 10 years ago, <laughs> about how to approach, approach a project like this? I assume you've learned a lot about your practice in the 10 years. Yeah. Uh, is there advice you would give to emerging artists who are embarking on similar work? Um, yeah, just uh, don't be afraid of the scary um, institutional gallery world. It's bad. It's, it's scary? <laughs> well, sometimes. Not all the time. But we have more and more um, indigenous curators and indigenous administrators right. and awesome allies that are working in these institutions now than I think 10 years ago. So That's great. Yeah. That's great. Okay. What's sort of next for you? In fact, I didn't really, I mean, we've talked about your uh, work on a, a sort of 10-year period. What's like your most current mm -hmm. work? Um, well, currently I'm artist in residence here at Harbor Front Center. Oh, cool. And so throughout the year. <laughs> what? Your reaction. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, that's good. I mean, that's great. Sorry. My applause lady is my biggest heckler, which is a bad situation. Weird. Um, Booing and laughing at me inappropriately. Sorry about the interruption. I'm going to fire all my staff on my last night. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Cool. Cool. <laughs> um, um, so throughout the year, I'll be able to interact with the site and uh, create works based on some of the programming here and also uh, interact with the public in certain programming and workshops. So, so you are, men are you kind of mentoring younger artists here? I will be. Okay. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah. And so how long are you here? 
A year. A Starting, year. I started in September, so. That's a long time to go without the love in Ottawa, all that loving. Well, I still live there. I'm back and forth. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, <laughs> if people want to learn more about you, where would you send them? I know you have a website because I went on the internet and there it was. I'm on the internet, uh, joytrcan.com. Yeah. That's the best place? The gooks. Are you on like uh, social media? Yes. What are you on? What are you, what are all you my like stuff's use? locked down, but you can go to mad underscore anti underscore on Instagram. Can you level with me? Did you lock down your social media because of my applause lady? Yes. She's a bit of a bit of an issue, I think. <laughs> I'm going to take this to HR later. How about a nice warm round of applause for Joy T. Arcan? <laughs> we'll be right back with Jay Ferguson of Sloan. Stick around. Thank you. This episode of Creative Control is sponsored by two amazing places. Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph. Freshly roasted, fair trade, certified organic coffee. You can learn more about Planet Bean at planetbeancoffee.com. Do you like coffee? Yeah, I like coffee. Uh, coffee is really good. I'm a kid and I don't personally drink it, but once I taste it, I love it. Oh, and cappuccino ice cream. I love cappuccino ice cream. Mm. What about you? Do you like coffee? No. Why not? I don't. Well, I guess I don't like the smell of it. Okay, that seems fair. But what about this? Let me lay this on you. Granddad's Donuts, located at 574 James Street North in Hamilton, Ontario. The best donuts anywhere. You can learn more about them at granddads.ca. Hey, do you like donuts? Yes. What's your favorite donut? Uh, chocolate with sprinkles on top. That sounds pretty good. What about you? Do you like donuts? Uh, I like coffee and donuts. My favorite donut is probably Boston Cream. Amazing. Amazing. You can get one of those at Granddad's Donuts. Thank you very much to Granddad's Donuts and Planet Bean Coffee. Oh, I love the Beastie Boys. How about a hand for the bicycles, everyone? They did a good job with that one, I thought. It's good. All right. How's everybody doing out there? How about another warm round of applause for uh, Joy T. Arcand, our previous guest? All right, our next guest is a, a member of one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time. They are currently <laughs> located in Toronto, Ontario, and their latest release is an anniversary edition of their classic album, Navy Blues. I have a copy of it right here. Please make some noise for Jay Ferguson of Sloan. Thanks. I think you might have gotten the best intro of the night. I don't know what happened. My, ch I, you know, <laughs> did you say one of the best or one the of the best? best one of the me? best. No, oh. I said the, one of the. Did it, what did I say? Can we roll the tape? Where is the? <laughs> no, you are. You are in one of the best. Oh, what does that feel like, Jay, to be in one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time? That must be nice. I'm just realizing it right now. I hadn't even considered it. So, <laughs> I feel great. How have you been? How have you been? Fine. Good. How are Good. you? Good. I know I haven't added. This is all an excuse for us to just get together and t catch up. Right. Frankly, in but front of people. In front of people, yeah, it's Amazon. fine. That's yes. the way it works. No, it's yeah. nice to see you. So you've been you uh, already touring a little bit behind uh, Navy Blues, right? Uh, you did some, yeah, a bunch of a fair amount of touring. Yeah. Right? So it's kind of this album for people who maybe not know. It came out like 21 years ago, and <laughs> right. it's just sort of like a, a reissue when we're playing the album front to back, and then we take a little break. And then we come out and play a bunch more songs, kind of thing. So it's like a kind of an, a celebration of a non anniversary, basically. <laughs> right. Know? The reason it, you, you put it out on the 21st year is because there was something else going on last year, right? You were. We we made, yeah, we made. Um, you made a record? A new, <laughs> a new <laughs> you made a new record. <laughs> so we made our 12th <laughs> record, which I think more people are excited about this, but whatever. No, no. Uh, whatever. Um, yeah, so it didn't. It just. Uh, we aren't really following anniversaries. We've been doing these kind of reissues since 2012. Yeah. And uh, so the pattern we're kind of on is do a reissue and a tour, then do a new record, make new music, then do another reissue and then make new music. And now we're now we're on uh, anniversary mode, well, right. not anniversary, but yeah, reissue mode. I think the last time uh, you guys put out a reissue it was for one chord to another, right? That's correct. Yes. And did yeah. you appear on the show for that one? Patrick and I showed up. Yes, pa and Patrick Pentland showed up and, and uh, came here. And you say he that was like really we, funny. He was we, good. It was good, but you say that like we should be surprised that Patrick would participate. Well, he's he's probably the least. Oh, well, maybe Andrew. Maybe uh, maybe well, Patrick is the least interviewed, perhaps. I well, actually, maybe Andrew is. I, I did a. I once did an interview when I worked for a, a different network, not the Long Winter Network, whom we love. Right, Long Winter, great network, <laughs> keep, keeping us on the air for all these years. But I used to work for a different thing, and I had uh, Patrick and Andrew 
on the show. You had, hold it. You had Patrick and Andrew together. Yeah, we at the had same breakfast time. together. And when I told breakfast, they were up eating breakfast yeah. with you. Actually, he said, Patrick said a thing to me. He's like, why are you eating the bun on my sandwich? <laughs> I said, what? I ordered a sandwich. What are you talking about? He's like, hey, you don't need the bun. And then that stuck with me all the time. Like, and now I, I'm always ordering things without the bun. So good job for Patrick. He's, oh, wow. uh, he's like changed my life. The, uh, I don't know if he's got a gluten issue or he just, he's, anti, he's anti-bun. I mean, I learned that. I didn't know that. I'll ask him next time I anyway, see him. Anyway, I told your colleague and mine, Chris Murphy yes. of Sloan, that I had uh, Patrick and Andrew on. And he said, what? Why? <laughs> That's, that's basically my response. Yeah, well, no, I'm I like... Kidding. No, it's great. No, but it's just an unusual pairing, and I think that's well, that's rare, and that's basically a scoop, as they call that's, it. The it's thing. interesting, because I think when he was here, I tried to give him a... Comp- Patrick, when he was here the last time with you, I gave him a compliment. I said, you write a lot of the bigger hits. Yes. And he went, I don't know. Like, he kind of he kind of undersold it, and I thought that's... Tr- and this album has... Uh, do you guys know the song Money City Maniacs? <laughs> That's on, it's not, there's no track Never listing here. I had to check, but I'm pretty sure it's on this record. I'll open it up in a second. That's a big, that was a big song. That song has, yes, quote unquote, pay the bills for sure. We are, uh, we go to, Rarely. James will very graciously sometimes take me to Toronto Raptors games. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden I'll hear Sloan and I'll be like, what is happening? Because before that, there's no Sloan. You don't and associate then, us with NBA basketball? No, it's just the whole intro with the siren and the blah, blah, every, it just gets everyone so amped up. No, I feel during the basketball season, and I get texts every time there's a game playing <laughs> and it'll be like your song is on I'm like oh it's like one of my like acoustic songs or something <laughs> and it's the like so which one is it cheap champagne <laughs> no no and sadly no yeah. gratefully it is uh, Money City Maniacs anytime so, yeah, someone nice. has to take free throw shots the lines you amend comes on <laughs> and it works out really well and right? then it misses completely and it's like <laughs> No, There's some uh, guy in the booth going like, who the hell put that song? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I ask, I mentioned in the last appearance because you said something that struck me, which is uh, you're someone who actually kind of enjoys nostalgia, uh, the past. Like you like <laughs> thinking about it. Like for some people, like putting together a package like this, which I'm going to open. This is going to be a special unboxing episode of the oh show. Oh, my God. I'm very excited. But uh, while you answer this question, I'll begin to uh, open this box <laughs> What's up. What's the question? Well, well the how que- I like the, to revel in no, nostalgia. No, I, I, I wonder, like, because you're doing this for each. of You've done it for twice removed. Yes. One chord to yep. another in navy blues. And what I'm going to ask you while I open this box is what kinds of memories did making this particular box conjure up for you? Uh, because this was an interesting time for Sloan. Like the the previous record was sort of a comeback because you vaguely sure. broke up, and yep. then this was like full throttle. We're Sloan. Like yeah. we're we're gonna do this. So what did you what do you think of when you think of this period? I feel like Navy Blues was the first record we made where there was people actually there was uh, not necessarily anticipation, but almost like oh one chord to another did well, therefore the next record is gonna do well. So it was almost not like pressure or anything like that, but I think. People at, uh, we had our own record label, Murder Records, but MCA at the time was putting it out and helping market it. I think they had, you know, it's like, oh, we're anticipating it doing well. And it did fine. It didn't do as well as one chord to another, to be honest. But it was the first, uh, you know, or it was like we really had good faith from much music and everything like that. So it was, uh, yeah, it was I a remember good time. this being very omnipresent. Yeah. And do you remember yeah. this period? Like James, you're a, James, if you don't know, is the editor of Exclaim Magazine, which has been around for. Uh, how many years now, James? Uh, 27, 27 years. years. Wow. Which means you've been kind of inadvertently sort of been around almost as long as Sloan. Um, so you've kind of charted... I, I've interviewed uh, everyone except Andrew. <laughs> and, uh, I, interviewed I can make that happen. In 1996, uh, from mm-hmm. Concord, yeah. first claim, uh, and I asked uh, about the... the interdynamic and within the band yeah. of uh, doing media in particular. Mm-hmm. And the response was, well, one of us isn't here. <laughs> oh. oh. Andrew, who I've, you know, so, so Andrew. But not, never interviewed him, and I, he's, a, I would say, the least interviewed. I think you're probably right. I don't know. No, sometimes. So I mean, it really was a game, and he's, he can be good at times. He yeah, was for sure. Yeah, it was good. really monumental that I got him on the show. I feel it is <laughs> monumental. It was monumental. Andrew's. Uh, I love Andrew's songwriting. Me too. I'm a drummer. Watching Andrew play the drums, I I learned how to play the drums. Dana, yeah. you like Andrew's drumming, don't you? Yeah, she is nodding. He's good. Very influential. Lots Andrew. Of Andrew. Chris. Chris started. Chris and I played in a band before Sloan, and he played drums. And Chris basically taught Andrew how to play drums in the early days. And within, I'm going to say, 
five days, Andrew was better than Chris. Like all right. So, so He's the like, other thing about Andrew, Andrew, and I know he's not here, and I yeah. don't want to stroke his ego, but he's something. I think of him as like a savant. Like he seems he good is. at most of the stuff he tries. He's wonderful. I'm a big fan of Andrew and his songs, and uh, I think he's great lyrics, wonderful piano player, maybe the best guitar player in Sloan, and uh, whatever. I, he's, I think he's, he's excellent. Really Fantastic drummer. Yeah. yeah. Can't and beat him. and I. Be- He's the best talk. Yep, oh, my him. God. If Chris no, hears this, we're dead. Yeah, no, he's great. And I'm he's sorry. I did, to be frank, I invited Andrew to be here uh, yeah. through you, I guess. Did you yeah, actually no, he, extend he the invitation? Had, uh, another thing to go okay. to tonight. That I, I was going to contact him directly. Tis the season and all that. This record is named after uh, a lyric in one of his songs, isn't it? Navy Blues? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah. He's, uh, he is significant. Okay, we're going to do this unboxing. We don't have a lot of time left here. But I want to go through some stuff here so that people... Uh, Listening and here tonight can see what's in this box set. So, what is this, Jay? What is this? Uh, like a that might there? be a long-winded story. In 1997, we released an all-white single with an embossed thing called the Rhodes Jam. It was like a one-take jam. Oh. That's the sort of answer to it that we decided to. Uh, it's like an outtake from Navy Blues. That's more like a instrumental jam. Anyway, okay, and go. is it what's on the other side? Uh, Part two of the instrument. Oh. <laughs> it's so okay. long. Very, very 60s kind of. It might be kinda. kind of boring, actually. Okay. Rockstar admitted Out to Lunch demo. I don't know these songs. What are so, these songs? Uh, Another seven inch, by Out the way. to Lunch is a Patrick uh, B-side that was only released in Japan, and that's like a demo of it. And Rockstar Admit It is a... Uh, an early version of another song called Summer's My Season that came out only in Japan. That's like an early oh. version of it, yeah. Okay, so we're getting... Nerds, basically. This is a... Uh, this is a card <laughs> oh that God. says uh, download. It's a yeah, download card. Right. Okay, yeah. that's not it special. Uh, what's this? This is a little. It's just a poster. Pamphlet? It's basically a filler, just to like make fill the box. Out. Should I? I'm not going to open it up. That's I only fine. have just one hand. It's a picture of us. It's a picture of Sloan, yep. which uh, this is Jay from Sloan. You can yeah, see right him. There, yeah. He's in the picture. Um, there's a book. Now, how come I've never been called upon to write any liner notes for Sloan reissues? It's all in house, man. You can't when nobody. Who does allowed. it? Who does it? Chris. Oh, for Christ! So when we make the books, we like to do them like <laughs> uh, we like to do them in an oral history style. So Chris will interview everybody in the band and uh, put it all together, and he does a really good job. But yeah, well, Vish, one day we'll maybe one day I'll get to do yeah, it. Maybe. maybe one day, probably I not. Doubt it. Are you going to make more of these box sets? Uh, as long as people, our fans, will tolerate them, sure, we'll keep going. Because we were, in fact, Chris and I were talking about like, what are we going to do next? Are we going to do the Smeared box set, which is our first album? Oh, or are we going to do a Between the Bridges box set, which is our fifth album? Uh, we have enough material to. Chris and I basically have saved everything. It's the main reason we're doing this is just to justify the boxes and boxes of crap that we've saved over the past thirty years. It's good to be and an archivist uh, in this day and age, don't you? I, I love it. Like I'm, I'm into it, and if no, no one else is going to do it except us, so we might as well do it. Yeah, it's fun. Okay, what do we have here? This is the album proper. So that's Navy Blues, just the uh, album itself. Is this a two? Su- it's just one record. I would have assumed this would be a double. I don't know. It no, just seemed like a long. LP, yeah. Okay. Originally, it came out like a gatefold, but for the box set, it's just got a, a single jacket. Like would you that. remaster it, remix it, or anything? Uh, no remixing, just a remaster. Yeah, and then that that album that you're about to hold up is a demo recording for every song on uh, Navy Blues as well. Okay, is Some there anything ramshackle four track recordings? Would each individual songwriter kind of work on stuff on their own at home and then bring it in? Is Basically, that, is that it's, what kind of, it's almost like the way our band has always operated. It's just right. like you work on your stuff at home, you bring it in. Maybe someone else will play on it, maybe not. Anything revelatory about the demos that you want to share? Uh, just that Chris does not know how to operate a four-track recorder, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yet he has my liner notes writing but, job. That's yeah. <laughs> sad to me because I can do both. Yeah. I'm just saying. No, I'm no. kidding. His for, actually Andrew's recordings sound great, and there's lots of different lyrics that we found in the four oh. track recordings, like early versions of the lyrics. And I don't know. It's it's definitely not for the casual fan. It's more for a deep dive. And then the f- the final record is uh, outtakes from the Navy Blues sessions, and then also some demo recordings of songs that didn't show up on Navy Blues. Some of the songs are on that for the first time. Some of them showed up on later LPs. But Which camera forms. can I show this to? What's that? I'm just showing this to a camera. We actually yeah. have cameras. This joke doesn't work. We actually have cameras tonight. So uh, can we get a zoom in on this? Look at these guys. Look at these handsome guys. Those bums. You have to actually walk over to the... Look, look at that. Handsome guy right there. Look at these guys. <laughs> Well, this band means the world to me, as you know, Thanks, man. Jay. I, I, uh, I'm still with you all this time. It's uh, significant to me. So I'm excited. I'm excited. Thanks for this, too. This is great. This is a great box set. You're welcome. And we're still with you, Vish. So uh, anyhow, I appreciate nice to be, that. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, on no. Your, uh, 
your final one. I feel like I should be singing Wind Beneath My Wings or something like we that. We have too. a band right here if you want to. Can you guys, do you guys know Sorry. Bette Miller? No, don't <laughs> count it in. I feel like uh, with Matt, I was making some Johnny Carson references, and I think there were other people in the room who did not know what we were talking about. <laughs> yeah. I would get them. I'm old, too. Yeah, um, so you alluded to the fact that uh, there may be another box set. It's yeah. interesting. I asked you about Smeared once, yeah, and you said, no, we're probably not going to touch Smeared, because you'd bypass Smeared with the first box, but now you're talking about potentially going we back? We would. Yeah, I think we bypassed it. We thought we would do Twice Removed, which is our second album. We thought we would do that first, just because I think... It's a bit of a fan favorite, and we thought we would start there instead of uh, smeared. But I think we could go back and do it. Do you yeah, have we'll enough see. material to round out the other box sets? Like yeah. it seemed really. Yeah, we could go. I mean, we could go for a while. I think. Really? Yeah. I That's don't know crazy. how far, but we'll see. Yeah. But we are then, based on what you were saying earlier, we actually might be in new album mode because of the way you've been doing these. We'll see. So the next, I mean, we're still touring Navy Blues through next year, oh. and uh, 2021 is our band's 30th anniversary uh, so we've been around for a long time oh, just wow. almost catching up to or sorry exclaim is almost there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks uh, anyhow um, so we don't know what we're going to do for that maybe we'll do a new record maybe it'll be something archival but we'll just have to see but I think we could make a new record I think okay. uh, anytime okay. if, feel like if you do a 30th anniversary tour will you probably come to Edmonton mm, I, don't, I don't know okay I'm not sure. we've actually <laughs> We never got I no, can just We were just there. It was wonderful. Yes, I Fish will have it. We'll, we'll be there. For I can set up a show for you at the mall. I don't know. Ooh, okay. I don't know how the That's mall good. works. They probably have really weird security guards or something. It's probably odd. Anyway, uh, for more information about, uh, is it sloanmusic.com? Is sure. That, yeah. You said, <laughs> is, yes, Is that is, domain yeah. for sale? Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah. Sure, go there. Pick it up. No, I think it is sloanmusic.com. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it is, yes, exactly. Okay. And, Thank you. And... and, and yeah, follow Sloan. Uh, go s- uh, when's your? Oh, sorry. When's your next shows? You got more shows coming uh, in Toronto. We're actually playing like an indie eighty-eight show at the Phoenix next week, which is like a benefit uh, oh, okay. as well that they do every year. Uh, but then uh, our Toronto show uh, for Navy Blues probably won't be till like April or May. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So again, I think it's SloanMusic.com. It is. Okay. Yes, SloanMusic.com. How about a hand for Jay Ferguson of Sloan, everyone? Thank you, Jay. We're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to have a panel discussion uh, with everybody who's been on the show. We're looking for audience suggestions for topics, so please come up with them, and I'll ask you to call them out uh, when we come back. But as I say, Jay Ferguson of Sloan will be back with more. Thank you so much. Hey, this is Nicole calling from Hamilton, and I needed to let everyone know that I really proudly support Vish and Creative Control. I have for many years, I will for many more, as long as he keeps delivering these amazing interview podcasts. When you hear one of Vish's interviews, you think he's known this guest for years, they're good friends, Uh, but the truth is he approaches every interview, whether it's sort of up and coming indie artists or established icons or like famous intimidating comedians with Uh, a really deep, genuine curiosity, so he's never met this person, and the same really warm uh, candor, as though he's known them forever. I think it really lends to a great chat, no matter who he's talking to, and for that reason, I think you should throw Vish, like what, a dollar a month? He's got jokes. The jokes make it worth it. Support Creative Control on Patreon. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. I'm Visha's wife, and remember, when you name a dog Janet or Timothy, you are dragging humanity down just a little bit. All right. Hello. Thank you very much. Again, another round of applause for the best damn band in late night, The Bicycles. Thank you, Bikes. Okay, as I uh, said earlier, uh, it's now time uh, on the show where we uh, survey the audience for topics uh, for a free-form panel discussion. So I'm going to take this opportunity now uh, to talk to you, the audience, and ask you for topics. Uh, that's going to happen in just a moment. I'm just going to ramble for a bit longer for no reason, and it'll delay things a little bit while you percolate, while you think, while you ruminate, while you whittle, while you whittle upon your thoughts. Now, now that you've had some time to think about it, does anyone have any topics for us to discuss? Does anyone have a topic? Oh, God. The future was the, um, 
That's very broad in some ways. Uh, anything in particular about the future that you'd like to know about? Maggie, you're making this very I'm personal curious. for me, and I'm just trying to do my show. Please. Security! Does anyone else have any topics beyond me? I'm doing my best just to keep it together right now. Sorry, one of the West Edmonton Mall. Okay, who here on the panel has... By the way, Joy, I'm going to move to the... Oh, what? You've been to the West Edmonton Mall? Many times. You've wanted to go back. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you like the, you like the mall? Yes. What do you like about the mall? Um, you can do everything there. There's pirate ships, there's water slides, there's movie theaters, there's a Hooters. Somebody should cut, okay. somebody should cut that as a commercial. Yeah. No so we got a, de- a deadpan commercial for the Edmonton Mall. Jay, Jay, you travel. Have you been to the West Edmonton Mall? I think I have, yeah. yeah. You think you have? Yeah. Is it that disturbing? You, there's a roller coaster and a Hooters. You think that would be memorable. <laughs> oh, no. I <laughs> remember. Yes, I have been there. It'd be cool if the Hooters was on the roller coaster, eh? That would be fun. I don't know where I'm going with this. Okay, anything uh, anything else? Do we have any other topics? <laughs> anything. We can talk about anything. It's fine. This, pardon? Maybe. Macrame? Maybe. Ooh, macrame. Maybe. What is it? Hey, hey. Macrame. Vaping. Vaping. Vaping? Vaping. Vaping. Oh, it's Does worse than here? smoking. I don't, I don't smoke anything at all. I know it doesn't seem that way at the moment, but does anyone here smoke? Yeah. And do, do you like, uh, you said that like uh, you were looking for applause. Where's the yeah. applause lady Where's now? the applause? No. Um, I just have a thing again. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry, what about vaping? All I was going to say is I'm hugely anti-vaping because I'm a firm believer in, I'm a firm believer in the devil you know. And I know how bad smoking is. If I smoke a cigarette, I know what that's doing to me. Okay. So I don't want to roll the dice. I want the evil that I know exactly how much I'm getting. Laura and Jay, you are musicians. Oh, wait, are you allowed to vape inside? I don't even know. Can you vape in? For, what? Not legally. Not legally. Do people, okay, so you guys are musicians. But Laura, have you, you got a show coming up or something? Have you played recently? I, no. <laughs> <laughs> I did not intend for that to be as sad as it ended up being. I just thought I would make conversation. My point here is... I might have is, a show coming up. You've got to just stay razor focused right. on my various web presences. But, right. Uh, okay. All, all I was asking about, though, is they're probably like as, as our uh, uh, scofflaw applause lady just mentioned, sometimes people vape indoors. You guys are performers. Jay, you must remember playing and trying to sing while people were smoking. Remember when people would smoke full-on cigarettes in front of you when you were trying to play your guitar? I remember one time playing at Maxwell's in Hoboken, New Jersey, and the drummer for the Deadly Snakes. Does anybody remember the Deadly of Snakes? Of course, yes. band. Standing right in front of me, having a great time, but like smoking nonstop, just blowing into my right face. Right into Sorry, your face. Blow, smoking nonstop, blowing into my face. Right. It was, very, it was a challenge that to That sounds uh, like a... Sing, yeah, anyhow. That, I'm glad... I mean, I'm, as I'm a nostalgic person, I'm very nostalgic for that smoking <laughs> on my face, but I'm actually secretly glad that that doesn't happen anymore. You know, Roger Daltrey from the, the band The Who, Yes, he's gone on a big tirade about people vaping in front of him because it, it messes up his vocal know, It form. looks cool, though. I don't understand that. Do, you, do people vape in front of you, Sloan, when yeah. you're performing? <laughs> are you are you are you? I think focused? they're too old. They don't know, even want to know what vaping is, our audience. They're basically Their audience is, yeah. Or our audience is too old. Generational to thing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Anybody else have any thoughts on vaping? I'm, I'm pro-regulation, too. I mean, I... Yeah, don't I, let the kids vape. <laughs> Don't, don't let the kids. It's been a, kind of a vape. depressing episode in so many <laughs> levels, and I feel like it's my fault. I was going to ask you, Joy, about the prairies. That's what I was trying to get to, because I'm moving to the prairies. Uh, do you have any advice for me? Uh, because uh, my good friend Maggie was worried about my future earlier. I don't care. I'm optimistic. She's optimistic about my future, but still, I'm moving to the. Yes, thank you, Jay. There's no applause, lady. She, she said, she's probably on a vape break right now. Anyway. <laughs> What, what do I have to be wary of or, uh, you know, about going to the prairies? I'm a little nervous. I'm a little, you know, a little stressed. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I wish somebody gave me advice on moving to Ontario. So let, I'm going to try to think about what I would have liked to hear. But you say this in retrospect. What, what did you wish you knew about Ontario that you, don't, you didn't know? Yeah, actually, everybody knows everything about Ontario, let's be honest. <laughs> we are kind of the center of the, the... We treat, we act like the center of the yeah, country. Yeah, true, right? true, And true. I'm moving to a province that really firmly thinks that. Yeah, so. but I like Edmonton. I like it better than Calgary. That's on record. 
Um, we're not in I, feel like, not I feel like that would be controversial in another venue, but here everybody's yeah, yeah, like, oh, right. like, what? Okay, who These cares? Are, is that in British Columbia? I don't know what's going on. I live in Ontario. Uh, is it going to be okay, I guess? Is my you're, you'll be okay. You're, okay. yeah. You're okay. just like, I don't know, explore. Explore? Is Get, that your advice? Explore. Get lost in the mall and try to find your car. Okay. It's like a Seinfeld episode. Is there... One more topic, because it's been going great. Is there one more topic we can get before we wrap up the show for the final time? No pressure. The bicycles? The band? Or the, or the means the vehicle? of transport? Uh, Joy, do people ride bicycles in Alberta? I'm just curious. I don't know. I am from Saskatchewan. Right, sorry. <laughs> do people ride bicycles in Saskatchewan? Yes, but it's very controversial. Why? Um, only well, ones powered with Canadian oil and gas. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, the Bicycles are a fantastic band. What are you guys up to beyond being my house band? Do you ever play? Is this your only gig? So this is probably a bit of a bummer for you. I'm sorry. Did you know before I made the announcement? Okay. We can keep doing it somehow. I think we'll, we'll keep doing it. Okay. Well, I think unless anyone else has any questions or topics, I have to go have a therapy session with my house band about uh, what we just went through together, but uh, no, is that... Maybe, is, okay, maybe, yes. just maybe, in the okay. future, um, hovering above Edmonton, there can be some kind of um, nano group consciousness cloud of vapor that is, it's autonomous, and it, it is all of us, and that's how it, it goes in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? Stranger things have happened. <laughs> that sounds that sounds dangerous, but I. Uh, I'm ready for it. That though. sounds that sounds fun. No, I I appreciate that. Okay, well, I think we're gonna wrap up the show. Does anyone have any final thoughts on the panel or James or anybody? I'm I'm sad that this is your last show because this is my first show of your show, and now that I know it's a thing, I like it, and now there's not any more of it. So oh, I'll, I'll have you back on the I show. I feel I feel bad about that. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you. This is the first time we've met. Joy, I've never met you before either. You were a pleasure. I'll come do this show in Edmonton. I should probably I, just... I won't. You, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> you can. You can come. It'll be fun. I don't... Have you ever been to Edmonton? No. It's great, I think. It's true. It's true. No, it's great. I've been there many times. You know okay. what? I would love to go to Edmonton. You should come. I would well, love to go to the West Edmonton Mall, for the record. Um, okay. I would like to experience it. But anyway. Okay. Well, I appreciate the kind words. Uh, Laura, do you have anything more you want to say? Oh, I love West Edmonton Mall. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The we roller coaster is great. Okay. And Jay, uh, any, any final thoughts? I'm putting you on the spot here. Uh, you have. Uh, no, but uh, bon voyage. <laughs> all right, James. In a positive any, way. Okay, I don't know what's going on, but I want to thank you all. Uh, how about a big warm round of applause for our guest tonight? And uh, Linda, the applause lady. Dave McKinnon for recording the show. All the tech here at the Harborfront Center. All the Long Winter crew. It's been a great pleasure to do this show. I hope I'll do it again sometime. Have a good night. We'll talk to you next time. Take it away, bicycles. Good night, everybody. See you soon. Yeah.